As some of you may be aware, I am absolutely obsessed with history. And two months ago, I came across the first part of what you're about to see, and I left a comment, relatively brief. Thought about making a video response to it, changed my mind, thought it was probably going to be dumb, and in reality it probably will be, nobody will probably watch this, but it doesn't really matter, I honestly don't care, because this deeply bothers me. Two months goes by, somebody likes that comment, I didn't remember any of this, went back, looked at comment, watched video, and was like, holy shit, this motherfucker. So with all that in mind, allow us to progress onward through the fog and enjoy the lovely twisted masterpiece that is the horribly rotten brain within the skull of this fucking retard we're about to endure. So I just wanted to give my perspective of someone who is like a left-wing, anti-capitalist, anti-racist, who does actually find Viking culture and history like very attractive. So this guy basically just admits that he's retarded. Which is great. I'm glad to see that somebody is willing to be straight up and honest about their mental retardation. To start with, I'm going to talk about my personal experience and perception of Viking culture. So like I said, I pretty much got into it recently, and that's thanks to Assassin's Creed Valhalla. So you only recently got into Norse culture because of a video game. And as you guys will know, if you read your medieval history, the notion that all European nations in medieval times were like white is pretty ridiculous. Nobody has ever said all of Europe at any point in history has always been white. That's just fucking insane. We had this discourse about the realism of Elden Ring when black creators wanted black hairstyles and they're saying that, well, there were no black people in medieval times, despite the fact that like Roman emperors who sat at Rome before the medieval times I were often black. No, they weren't, but we'll get back to that in a second. Anytime you have a video game that is themed around European fantasy, everybody freaks the fuck out because, oh my god, too many fucking white people. They freak out over diversity. Whenever a Japanese game is made that's a Japanese fantasy game with entirely Japanese characters, nobody fucking cares. Nobody says a word. Nobody says, uh, uh you know, uh, my diversity. If you just came out and said, I hate white people and want them to die, I would respect you more. Now to address the Roman thing, what you just said was a lie, sir. You lied, that was a lie, okay? You just straight up fucking lied. The reason I know you lied is because you didn't even bother to try to correct it. Like you went through the effort of editing this whole video, saw that you said, that Roman emperors were often black and then just completely moved along like it was fine. There's no way that you would see what you said and not correct it unless you're lying. It is not true that Roman emperors were often black. That is absolutely fucking false. Only four in Roman history came from Africa. And just because they came from Africa does not mean that they're black. I mean, I'm gonna put pictures of their busts on the screen, and you can tell me for yourself if you honestly think any of the features shown in these busts at all characterize a fucking black man. There were plenty of North Africans who went to places like Spain. Most of Spain was owned by various Arab kingdoms and caliphs and stuff like that. The fact that people believe there were no non-white people in Europe is just basically a myth. History is a lot more diverse than you're led to believe, and that's something to remember whenever you see people trying to claim elements of history for their own political ideology. The majority of people in Europe, especially Western Europe, were white. Was there some amount of diversity well, of course, there was a lot of trading, there was a lot of slavery, there was a lot of things that happened. So Scandinavian studies professor Natalie van Doysen says historical records and DNA evidence show that the age of Nordic racial purity touted by racists never existed. So the most compelling evidence refuting racial purity is DNA analysis of skeletal remains from the Viking Age, which reveals a high degree of ethnic exchange. The extent to which people married and also took slaves or concubines from different places they went indicates it wasn't a pure Germanic monoculture. The Vikings traveled to what is now Newfoundland, she said, trading with people who were probably the ancestors of the Inuit. They also traveled to Islamic Spain and to Baghdad and to Constantinople. They were pretty much everywhere and they had peaceful relations and non-peaceful relations. A striking feature of the early Viking success was their ability to embrace and adapt from a wide range of cultures, whether that be the Christian Irish in the West or the Muslims of the Abbasid Caliphate in the East. But thankfully now people are looking at this differently and seeing that, yes, the Vikings had like trading outposts, settlements, 
all around the known world at the time. A lot of them adopted cultural practices and took wives and had children who were not white, who were not pagan, often were Christian or Muslim or some sort of like Orthodox Christian. And if you believe these people are some sort of like representative of your own right-wing ideology today, you only have to read a bit of history to understand how ridiculous that is. But again, all these right-wing types need revisionist history or their whole narrative just gets destroyed. This very modern and very Western view of ancient history has created this delusional fantasy that the West has somehow always been the beacon of multiculturalism and diversity, which is just insanely and laughably false. The best example of a diverse multicultural society was ancient Rome. That being said, yes, all of Europe didn't suddenly become monocultural civilizations after Rome fell. On the other side of the coin, just because most of medieval Europe was exposed to other cultures through slavery and trade with the occasional interracial marriage, doesn't mean, thus, they were somehow ethnically diverse and multicultural either. The reality is that this guy and much of modern academia is simply revising history in order to basically just blame America for Hitler's Holocaust by somehow blaming America also for inventing racism. Yes. Seriously, that is actually a thing. So anyway, now that we got that out of the way, that's the excerpts that I thought were most relevant from the first video that I mentioned early on in the intro to this. Now we're gonna get into the newer stuff. I wanna start with the Spartans and I wanna talk about why these guys have been mythicized, why people love them, why people think they are the height of, I guess, you know, Western civilization. So to start with, I guess we have to talk about the film 300. Now, the film 300, which is pretty overtly fascist, including the graphic novel as well. How the fuck is it fascist? Do you even know what fascism means? Do you know how many examples of fascism actually exist in history? The term fascist has lost all fucking meaning. It doesn't fucking mean anything anymore. People have often made excuses for this and said, well, it's about a soldier telling other Spartans about this war, of course it's propaganda. If the theme of the film is how war often makes societies fascist or something. No, it didn't make the society fascist because the society was a fucking militarized monarchy. It was anything but fascist. Like, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. You can't just say fascist, fascist, fascist every single time you see something you don't agree with because that's not what fascism means. It's a form of government. I think it failed quite poorly because what you essentially get is something that was made at the height of the war on terror where you have visibly white European versions of Spartans who probably wouldn't look much like this. Black hair, very heavy tan. Those motherfuckers look Greek as fuck. Fighting an extremely racist version of the Persian Empire where you have Xerxes played by a Brazilian man covered in like this makeup and all these piercings and it makes Persia look like the height of degeneracy in ancient culture where the Spartans are oh so civilized and must protect the whole of Greece, the whole of the West from these awful Persians. Hello, future me here. So ignoring the argument that one could make that the film does a pretty decent job of showcasing the racism and or tribalism that often spawns as a direct result of war, I would instead make the argument that the film is more of a byproduct of modern filmmaking. What I mean by that is there's a very common trend in filmmaking today where you make the good guy as cartoonishly good as possible and the bad guy as cartoonishly bad as possible in order to visually establish a good and evil dichotomy. And although this unnuanced style of filmmaking is often obnoxious and annoying, it is not generally a byproduct of racism. And not mentioning that Persia was a relatively more progressive society and actually contributed more to world history than the Spartans ever did. But of course, let Frank Miller and Zack Snyder tell you different. What a completely dishonest take that is, all right? Yeah, of course the entirety of the Persian Empire contributed more to world history than a singular fucking Greek city-state. I mean, what the fuck? That'd be like me saying the British Empire contributed more to world history than one of the 13 colonies, right? Like, that's just insane, okay? That's fucking crazy. What a, what a fucking horribly dishonest thing to say. Secondly, on the subject of which one was more progressive, I have to point out that the two are actually more similar than they are different. I mean, they both had slaves, 
So that just kind of throws out any form of progressivism, like just throws it out the window. In times of war, they were very similar because although you could argue that the Spartans had compulsory service, meaning that they forced all the men into military service, you know, something that's done to this day in countries like Italy and Switzerland, the Persians actually used conscription which is something that the majority of Greek city-states did. That is to say, in a time of war, the Persians would actually force people, many of them that aren't even military, to actually join their war. So it's not really much different. In fact, I would actually argue that the Spartans were better in that regard because they weren't forcing farmers to take up the spear. You, there, what is your profession? I'm a potter. And you, Arcadian, what is your profession? Sculptor, sir. And you? Blacksmith. Spartans! What is your profession? And now all we're left with is basically every progressive's favorite victim. Women. So how did the Persians treat their women compared to the Spartans? Well, in Persia, they actually, you know, trained their women in warfare, or at least allowed women to train in warfare, I guess I should say. They also, you know, educated women. So that's, that's fair. They also, more importantly than that, allowed women to own land. However, that was only the rich women. So let's look at Sparta. In Sparta, women, like men, were actually forced to learn military strategy, formation, etc. And the reason being is so that they could actually actually be the last line of defense in case the men were gone. They also gave women the same education as men. Okay, women could also own lands, women could also own slaves, which is also true in Persia, by the way. And in both cases, this only applies to female citizens. The difference being that in Persia, that only applied to rich women, whereas in Sparta, it applied to all women, of course, whom were citizens. But on top of all of that, Spartans actually treated their women pretty well. They loved their women. In fact, one could argue that the men were pussy whipped by women. The women in Sparta were actually known, well known, for being strong, independent women, right? So if anything, women in Sparta are like a fucking feminist sweat dream. So in other words, I don't really understand why you're making the argument that one was more progressive than the other when neither was particularly progressive at all. Now, many of you might not know too much about the Spartans because besides 300, there isn't really much pop culture about it. I would say one of the better versions of them is in Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which is a game I really like. Wow, another video game. Who would have guessed that? Who would have saw that fucking coming? Isn't that fucking interesting? Like, I cannot believe he has an habitual habit of citing video games to make any point in any way, shape, or form. He says that this is a superior depiction of Spartans, but I have to ask, is it really, though? If he doesn't like the movie 300, based on the fucking Greeks in the movie looking too European, then he should also say the exact same thing about the fucking video game that he's talking up, saying it's the greatest depiction of fucking Spartans ever. And honestly, when looking at it, I can't really tell the difference at all whatsoever. You know, it's all Greek to me. But of course, although Germans in the 30s and 40s liked Spartan society, Spartans aren't most famous for the way they structured their society. They're most famous for fighting wars. But how true is it that they were actually this amazing fighting force that the whole world should remember. Like, was there anything really special about them besides every Spartan man having to essentially give his life to military service? In terms of combat, no, not particularly. Even though Phoebians and Thespians also stayed and fought to the last man, the story was all about how the Spartans had done so. Even though the Persians triumphed and the Greek defeat brought untold suffering upon the Phocians and Athenians. You do realize there's actually a really good reason why the Spartans stole the limelight over the Battle of Thermopylae, and that is because their king fucking sacrificed himself in that battle. He became a martyr. The story was always that the Spartans' defiance made the battle a moral victory. They had sacrificed themselves for Greece. They had lived up to their harsh laws and died where they stood. At Thermopylae, Sparta made its name as a society of warriors. Afterwards, everyone feared them. We are frequently told of their shaking knees and chattering teeth of those who know they're going up against the Spartans. However, from sources from the classical period, it becomes clear that Spartan is feared and respected in warfare only because of Thermopylae. No one can name any other example of Spartans fighting to the death against insurmountable odds. When the Spartans surrendered at the Battle of Vectaria, 
Comparisons were immediately drawn with the men of Leonidas, whose reputations warriors had failed to live up to. There are apparently no other go-to example of Spartan prowess. I can think of a great example, the Siege of Sparta. That's a fantastic example. So as we saw from that article, the whole notion that Sparta was an amazing military power was all down to the Battle of Thermopylae and the propaganda around the Battle of Thermopylae. And that's all Sparta was really known for, for contributing to Western civilization is stopping those barbaric Persians from conquering all of ancient Greece. But then the Spartans didn't mind allying themselves with the Persians a bit later. But if you delve into any real history of the Spartans in the time period, you will see while their society was interesting, the way they structured it was interesting, the history is interesting. There isn't really anything that notable about them as these absolutely invincible warriors, apart from a battle they lost in a war they lost that in the end didn't really matter so much to them because like I said, they allied themselves with the Persians later. Yeah, so I don't know why he's so hell bent on focusing on the fact that they allied with the Persians after the war was over, like some years later. I mean, that happens all the time in war. That's always happened in war. And besides all that, I don't know where he's getting this idea that anybody ever said Spartans were fucking invincible. Who the fuck says they're invincible and then talks about the sacrifice of Leonidas? That doesn't make any fucking sense. It's just had a massive cultural influence on everyone, the founding fathers of America people during that period in other places, people in World War II, all talking about like how free and great Sparta was, despite the fact it could only exist based on enslaving thousands of other Greeks. Sports teams, military stuff, even Master Chief in Halo, they're all named after Spartans or had the iconography of Spartans. There is a Western fetishization of Sparta, which is completely against the actual history of Sparta. These people weren't the best warriors of all time. They weren't even that notable in their own time. It's just all propaganda that you think they were especially good soldiers. And that is pretty much it. And a lot of it is far right propaganda at that. But again, nobody's making the argument that they were some kind of invincible military force because if they were, then they would still exist and they don't. And also lastly, I don't understand why you keep bringing up slavery as some kind of gotcha because literally every single ancient culture that ever existed all had slaves. Even the Persians you're fucking defending had slaves. What I find interesting about both these groups and their links to like far right ideologies or like more conservative ideologies is that they both have to rely on wildly inaccurate histories to make kind of like a similar point about warrior culture. So with the Spartans, it's obviously true their whole society was oriented around war especially for spartan men that's literally all they did but there is a huge myth that they were the best fighters around or even noteworthy but they did live in an authoritarian monarchy built on slave labor and conquest this is just a repeat of what he just said look I'm not going to readdress that. But what I am going to point out is how come he didn't call them fascists? And that is essentially the far right in a nutshell. Take history, cherry pick it, or completely distort it and make it your ideology. No, it's not the far right in a nutshell any more than it's the far left in a nutshell. It's idiocy in a nutshell. And you are one of those idiots. Imagine sitting around playing video games, developing a sudden interest in history in order to reshape history in a way where you can attack a political alignment that you don't agree with. That is sad, pathetic, and honestly, pretty goddamn cringe.